Fiona Wright and I'm reading today from my second collection of essays, The World Was Whole. Um, I'm reading a piece from, uh, reading an extract from a piece called A Regular Choreography, uh, which is an essay about travel, um, because that's the thing that we're not doing at the moment. But underneath the travel story, it's really a piece about uh, ordinariness, the idea of the everyday, about ritual and routine, um, and a sense of home, which I think are things that we are all um, suddenly in contact with in possibly new ways at the moment. Um, so this is an extract and I'm just going to get started. It took me some time to realise this, but part of what was bothering me about my nervousness, about my hesitancy around travel, was not just my personal history, how I still joke that I'm the only person who has ever spent six weeks in Germany and come back thinner. How I fainted on the overnight train somewhere between Marrakesh and Tangier out of a combination of malnutrition and horrendous gastro. How vividly I remember my flight home from Sri Lanka. The thin padding of the airline seats woefully mismatched to my protruding hip bones. Shoulder blades that have never been more aptly named. But a cultural narrative too. Travel is supposed to be transformative, worldly, independent, brave. It is supposed to be a breaking free from the things that bind us to our everyday and repetitious and by implication dull and stultifying lives. We are supposed to value travel because of this, because it is international and not domestic, unsettling and not homely, disjunctive rather than routine. And I want these things. Of course I want these things for my life and for that idea of myself as I'd like to be. But it's a narrative that also devalues everything that lies on the other side of the equation. The domestic, the homely, the repetitious and the known. The worlds in which we ground ourselves, locate ourselves, build the small rituals and habits that make us feel more comfortable and maybe even safe. The spaces where we may truly be ourselves our private, unscrutinised and unperformed selves, our small but significant selves. When I arrived in Iceland, at the international airport originally built as part of a US Army base in 1943, before which the country had relied on seaplanes, with no real need for anything larger or more formalised, I climbed into a huge white coach, waiting by the temp... I climbed into a huge white coach waiting by the terminal to ferry passengers to Reykjavik, almost 40 minutes away. I sat at a window so that I could watch this strange new place as we trundled through it. I was hyper alert, wide eyed and watchful, even though I'd been in transit by this stage for almost 30 hours, had barely picked at the trays of horrible airline food in all that time. I felt raw too, rubbed back by all the small encounters I'd had in transit the chatty Welsh woman returning home from Brisbane where she'd been visiting her grandchild for the first time, the young couple, him with tribal style tattoos curling up the sides of his neck, her entirely in stretchy black, who'd curled against each other to sleep and took photos out of the tiny plane window the moment we landed outside of London, their new home, and the Midwestern American who'd asked me repeatedly to figure out the time zones in the places he was traveling between until I'd shown him how to do this on his phone. By the time I landed, I was feeling raw and so alone. In the bus, I sat on top of my hand luggage so I'd be high enough for a proper view of the flat fields of black basalt stretching unbroken to the coastline, the heavy sky pressing down upon them. There were sculptures by the highway, huge boulders arranged into eerie, almost human scapes. These figures looking out to the horizon as if they too were lost, were new, in this landscape that seemed to me to be so ancient, although I couldn't say how or why. Occasionally, we'd pass a cluster of brightly coloured and blunt-faced houses, or one more in a chain of oversized supermarkets with cartoon pigs grinning madly on their windows. The man sitting next to me wore a suit jacket and jeans and spent the duration of the journey holding a mobile phone in each tanned hand, alternately reading emails on one screen and sending WhatsApp messages on the other. I was irrationally annoyed by this behaviour, even though he was sitting neatly, quietly, unobtrusively, unlike so many of the other people, especially men, who I'd been seated beside in all the stages of my journey. I knew that I knew nothing about him, who he was texting, 
what he had left, why he was here. But I kept thinking, all this is extraordinary, so sparse and blank and stony that we could well be on the moon, and you are looking at your emails. And yet, within a week I'd find myself, each evening, after a full day of travelling around the Icelandic coastline, along the only highway named accordingly Road 1, of hiking around waterfalls and glaciers or the rims of dormant volcanoes, of watching whales or standing in the steam of geysers or swimming in the cloudy blue water of geothermal baths while lifeguards in enormous fleece-lined jumpsuits and snowproof boots stood sentinel on the shore. After all of these things, I would sit in my guesthouse room by myself and pull out my computer, check emails, check social email, check, check emails, check social media, send messages to my family and friends, and it felt wonderful and relieving every day to do this. What this speaks about, I think, is what Iris Marion Young, drawing on Simone de Beauvoir before her, considers the two kinds of time in which we live our lives, the transcendent and the imminent. Transcendent time is that rare, luminous time of important or startling events, like travel, or those intense first weeks of falling in love, or the sweeping grief of sudden loss, the shock of an argument that wounds. These are moments when we are transported out of our regular selves and assumptions, where time feels differently, slowed or furiously hastened. It is time that breaks the rules of everyday life. Imminent time, however, is the rules. It is regular, unruffled. It passes mostly without us noticing. But we need imminent time to rest, to reflect, to maintain our sense of self. And it is within imminent time that we live more completely and more often, if less intensely. It is here that we are at home, wherever we may physically be. And it was to here that I needed to return at the end of every day in order to return to, to myself. That first evening in Reykjavik, I rolled my suitcase into the basement flat of a beautiful three-storey white house, an Airbnb opposite a church built of grey concrete, arching up into the overcast sky. The people I was staying with, good friends and writers all, and all in Reykjavik for the same conference, were sprawled across the couches when I got there, reading, tapping away at laptops, marking up a manuscript. Earlier in the day, and after settling into the house and exploring the nearby parts of the city, they had bought food for us all at a nearby supermarket. Muesli, pasta, apples, skier, crackers and cheese, two bottles of red wine to share, and I panicked. And so the first thing that I did in Iceland was buy groceries. Walking through the suburbs past garden beds exuberant with the largest, fullest tulips I have ever seen and round trampolines with children wrapped in parkas and helmet-style helmet beanies bouncing through the endless twilight. I bought a tiny cauliflower the size of my palm, a head of broccoli, a packet of dried figs. I returned to the house and stood under the shower that smelt strangely, strongly sulfuric because the hot water was geothermal piped into the city from a volcano barely 20 kilometres away, breathing into the bottom of my lungs to steady myself, to hold myself in my body. That night, I slept on a roll-out single bed in the same bedroom as a couple, and it was soft and thick and finally so blessedly horizontal. And from the very next day, I started building habits. After I woke in the morning and dressed myself in six or seven layers, I walked across the city past the angular town hall, all glass and granite and water features, along the shore of the lake lined with dandelions and scotch broom, and up the hill, the houses quiet still and sleepy. I sat in a cafe that two of my friends had recommended after they had travelled to Iceland last year in midwinter, and I wrote for a while in my journal. I always and only keep a journal when I travel, trying not to worry about the full cream milk in my coffee. I bought a loaf of crusty, oaty bread from a nearby bakery with windows full of cinnamon scrolls and custardy pastries to eat for lunch much later with tomatoes and basil and soft cheese. That day, the day before the conference started, my friends met me near the cafe and we walked for several hours through the town, crossing underneath the freeway to a forested park on its outskirts, talking the whole time of books and films and writing and ideas and wondering if we might see a bear. There are no bears in Iceland. When we got back to the house that afternoon, we read and worked and wrote, and I felt comfortable and probably present and in time in a way that I so rarely do. 
Each day I did this, rose early, dressed, walked to a cafe and wrote quietly and by myself, even or especially once the conference started and I needed to be at the university by 8.30 a.m. Each day in this wildly unfamiliar place where every time I headed to a new place on my map, I would instinctively turn first in the wrong direction, where I hadn't yet learnt to pronounce the long and thickly consonanted check where I hadn't yet learnt to pronounce the long and thickly consonanted street names or to handle my money quickly or appropriately, I kept to a morning rif- ritual almost identical to the one I have at home. For a long time, I have been embarrassed by my rituals, or more precisely, by how fervently I cling to my routines. I know this used to be because I saw my repetitions as rigidity, the same kind of pathological rigidity I had been taught to recognise as part and parcel of my illness. It still makes me anxious to eat earlier than my regular meal times, to eat ingredients that aren't part of my usual repertoire, and these two things at least are inevitable when I travel. I still feel jittery and unsettled if I have to change plans quickly, have to rethink the regular patterning of my day. But I also know that when I'm doing well, it's routine and ritual that keep me on track, that keep me eating afternoon tea while reading in my favourite armchair, making supper even though I really do not want to, having breakfast while I write. When I'm doing well, it's structure that keeps me from inventing reasons to walk the hour from my house into the city for not really necessary chores, or skipping meals because I'm busy, or reorganising my kitchen so that the spices are in alphabetical order. For all the myths of the intensity and extremity of mental illness, the reality is exceptionally dull. But I also know that my embarrassment stems from the way we are taught to devalue this repetition, this imminent time to see it as something that limits us, as something static, boring, immobile, and immobilizing too. In Reykjavik, in summer, I was amazed to see so many people still on the streets and in parks each weeknight at close to midnight, adults and awkward gangling teenagers alike, wearing shift dresses and short sleeves, despite what felt to me like unbearably low temperatures. There's people picnicking or sitting outside in bars or simply walking, chatting. I mentioned this to an Icelandic writer, Svanna, whom I'd recently befriended, and she laughed and said, oh, we all go a little bit crazy in summer. We sleep again in September. In winter, we become normal again. I loved the idea of this, this six-week summer of abandon. Of course I did. It's romantic and exciting and sounds like a surrender to happenstance and chance encounters, all of the things that make good narratives good or at least not terrible romantic comedies that make transcendent time, but at the same time I know I wouldn't cope, that my body would fatigue, grow less resilient, that ankylous my mind would slowly but surely unmoor. Recent research suggests that habits and routines, the repeated actions that are generally undertaken in what psychologists call stable contexts, times of day or spaces that are unchanging, make up at least 40% and perhaps as much as 60% of our daily activities. And that when we act habitually, we do so without being fully cognizant of our movements. But this is precisely why routines are important, because of this repetition, this muscle memory. That means that we don't have to make decisions and stay alert. Our conscious minds are freed for other things, for remembering and planning, certainly, but also for rest and restoration, for imagination, creativity dream. Without habit, that is, we can't reflect. I know it's often while I'm running errands or showering or baking biscuits for my friends or walking my habitual routes that I somehow unravel problems in my writing or stumble across phrases and images that might be the beginning of a poem. I know I'm not alone in this. So many of my writer friends so often say the same. I often think this has to do with rhythm that when we move habitually, we move according to a regular choreography and the brain responds by dancing too. What this means though, is that we need this kind of imminent time in order to function fully and especially to access our higher functions. We need imminent time in order to transcend. At the end of the conference, I left Reykjavik to travel around the countryside and I did it by joining a tour. When I had booked this months beforehand, I kept explaining the decision away. I was extremely busy and couldn't find the space or time to properly research how and where I might get around on my own. It's not how I normally travel, but I'll give it a go. If the people are terrible, they weren't. 
it will make for good material. But what I was really trying to excuse, I know, was the idea that I was doing this the easy way, the lazy way, the inauthentic touristy way, the way that wasn't clever or adventurous or brave. Much later, I realised that even when I travelled this way, I still had to work and plan so much, and so much more than most people, to organise my food and keep myself well, and joining a tour simply relieved me of one layer of decision making. This is true, and became even more true as the tour progressed, and I realised we'd been stopping every day for lunch at service stations or supermarkets, from which the others would bound back happily with packets of licorice, Icelanders love licorice and sell it everywhere, and savoury biscuits, or chips, the occasional banana, locally grown in the geothermal greenhouses we kept passing by the highway, but which left me too overwhelmed and panicky to choose anything at all. Or when I tried to explain my dietary needs to a guest house restaurant, and the waitress returned to serve me a plate of three grilled asparagus spears for dinner. This was true, but it still felt like an excuse. On the tour though, I loved listening to our guide rattle off Icelandic place names, which sound complicated and ornate, but are actually bluntly pragmatic. Waterfalls named Hengafoss and Litlanisfoss and Detafoss, or Hanging Waterfall, Little Waterfall, Falling Waterfall. Towns named Borgarfutur, Ayakuri, Dalvik, or Fjord City, Shoalfield, Valley Bay. Even the famous volcano Eyjafjallajökull which shrouded most of Europe in flight-delaying ash in 2010 and whose names confounded newsreaders, but simply means forest, mountain, glacier, because it's a glacier on a mountain in a forest. On the tour, I loved the way our guide, who introduced his, himself as Biggie, saying that his real name, Birgir, with its double rolled R's was too difficult to pronounce, would occasionally tell Icelandic jokes. Driving past a pocket of stunted birches growing sideways against the wind, he stated, what do you do if you get lost in an Icelandic forest? You stand up. After most of the tour had eaten fresh seafood from a roadside barbecue and then climbed back onto the bus with the smell of fish strung on their hands and clothes. In Iceland, we call that the smell of money. Until the recent tourist boom, fishing made up 70% of Iceland's economy. I was the only person in the group traveling alone and so I sat most days in the single front passenger seat next to Birgir, singing along to the Icelandic music that he played through a Spotify list on his phone of Mice and Men, Sigur Ross, Emiliani Torini, Björk, or chatting about his hobbies, which included ice climbing, apparently something of a national pastime, whereby people scale frozen waterfalls in winter using hooked ice picks and steel spikes strapped over their shoes. It was relaxing to not have to make arrangements, to float along on that single highway according to predetermined plans. Each time we stopped, Birgitta would say, we will be here for 45 minutes. The track to the left is the more interesting one. These are the last toilets for about an hour and a half. He'd frequently phone ahead while we explored these places, confirming logistics and timings and menus. I wasn't used to this, not at all, but I liked it. And some of the things that we saw was spectacular. A lagoon at the foot of a volcano with cobalt blue water and huge bobbing icebergs carved from nearby glaciers. Some streaked black with granite, some teeming with arctic terns, some clanking and groaning as they bumped against each other. A nearby beach with icebergs stranded on the sand. Bulbous lava fields, miles and miles of solid rock that still looked fluid, bubbling, and that were covered with lichens that take a century to grow a steeply angled glacier that we walked on, kitted out in waterproof pants and hired crampons. The staff had laughed when I told them my size in both shoes and clothes and handed me their smallest options, two sizes too big. The ice crunchy at the surface, smooth and strangely luminescent in its depths. But even here, learning a wide gait, wide-legged and with a heavy tread for walking on ice, wearing clothes that weren't my own, or standing on a cliff edge in the windiest inhabited place in the world, 10 time zones and 16,600 kilometers from anything I call home, I could not escape myself, my body. I was always cold, cold to the bone, even though by the time we hit the south coast, I'd taken to wearing nine layers of shirts and a pair of stockings underneath my jeans. I couldn't really move my arms, but also didn't really need to. 
On the bus, too, I'd keep my down jacket on, zipped right up to the chin, my hands stuffed into its fleecy pockets. One of the group, an older, freckled man from Cape Town, said to me, you cannot really be that cold. And I answered instinctually, but also feeling censured. It's just because I'm underweight. He laughed at this, a full and throaty roar, and said, I've never heard a woman say she's underweight before. Two days later, whilst hiking up a rocky mountain path towards a waterfall, another man, this one part of a couple from Perth whom I befriended and who'd slipped me coffee bags in the morning when we stayed somewhere that only served thick and awful American-style brew, turned to me and said, you've got a lot of fortitude for someone so small. How much do you actually weigh? From the very first day, after the first time, we stopped to buy lunch at a small town supermarket and I couldn't find anything to eat, put on the spot like that. This circumstantial skipped meal had become an iron-bound rule within my mind. You don't need lunch. You're not allowed. Instead, I'd become vague and flattened by 4pm. One day in particular, I remember walking around volcanic rock formations, huge and crooked spires twisting up towards the sky, jagged arches, a hollowed out dome almost cathedral-like in shape, and feeling my body drag, wanting nothing more than to be back on the bus, done for the day, heading back for a guest house so I could stand under the shower until my fingers and toes felt mobile and alive again, then boil some vegetables inside this tea station kettle in my room, be by myself, be quiet. We spent so much time outdoors, walking, hiking, climbing, standing at lookouts in the cold and it was beautiful and it was thrilling but it was also very physical and my body so too my brain couldn't keep up this was what i'd feared before i left this shutting down this feeling of enduring both because i know it now is a forewarning but also always because it feels like such a waste and wasting transcendent time seems almost criminal but imminent time we're taught the ordinary time of rituals and the mundane is time that we are always wasting on chores and acts of maintenance, on menial and mindless tasks. These things seem unimportant, I think, because they're small and because they're private and largely domestic and largely the work of women, because they are unspectacular. But so much of our lives are lived in imminent time. So much of what we do is ordinary and our habits are acts of autonomy and anchoring they are integral to our sense of self, wherever we may be, and to our sense of normality. Our habits, Rita Felsky writes, are intermeshed with identity because the distinctive blend of behavioural and emotional patterns that make them up make us up too. And they are the simplest, most effective ways that we can grant ourselves dignity and comfort. Two things, I think, that are so often denied to those of us who are unwell. Our habits are homely, but it is, it is for precisely this reason that they are important, because they allow us to rest, to dwell. Uh, there's much more of that essay that continues on from there, and I hope you enjoyed that. Um, thank you.